Okay, it's not explicitly covered, but I think it's implicitly covered. If not clear, then ask again. So basically, uh, I would suggest you may want to you know, get something to write on, because I'm planning to throw a lot of information at high speed in your direction. Uh, because it's a lot of topic to cover in about two hours. So just uh, be ready to jot things down. And uh, you know, again, feel free to interrupt and ask clarifying questions. Because when I'm listening to presentation, half the time you know, I'm not agreeing with the person or I have question, and then it's never, by the time they finish, I forget what they was. So don't be afraid to <clears throat> jump up and uh, ask clarifying question. But I'm planning to cover, like, you know, b basically all aspects of fundraising. Let's realize first that we all need oxygen to live. And capital, money, is like oxygen to businesses. If you don't have oxygen, you're going to be dead soon. So you have to have oxygen. And this is really what about that. And what people don't realize, that dif different sources for this money, you don't always go to VC. There's a time to go to VC. There's a time not to go to VC. Because when I came here, I thought, OK, you have an idea. Let's go to a VC. That's completely wrong. So we will talk about that. The reason is you go through with any idea with some sort of prototype to some kind of a developing the product, then deploying it, then hopefully selling it to many, many people channel, and then some expansion, maybe international. So as you go through these phases, there's a different source of capital. It's not the same person. Yeah? I'm so sorry to interrupt. Will these slides be available to us? If, uh, if at least 10 people insist, then I'll make a PDF. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Now the question is, uh, who do I send them to? All right, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll make them. Short answer is yes. <laughs> I have put down the website. Question is, which web should I? I think I should put them in namesofar.com. On Thai website? So you can do that too. I can also put it on namesofar.com. And so either way. Yeah. It, it will, it, and I think I have one version, older version, on slideshare.net. But I made many new slides this morning. So this is a little updated version. So the thing is, when you're going to prototype, nobody's going to give you money. No, do not approach a VC. This is when you're going to use your own savings. And you're talking about like, and in you know, a couple thousand to ten to fifty thousand dollars. When you get to this angel stage, when you're developing a product, you're a little bit more solidified the idea, and you're raising up to two million dollars, an angel investor makes sense. But when you go beyond that, is angels don't play bigger than that. Then you need VCs. And at some point, even the late stage VCs come into play, and finally when you're expanding, you need like five hundred million dollars. This is when you go public or private equity. So there's a different time for each kind of stage you are in. It's not the same people. So question is, what is the VC model? How do they make money? And how do we present to them, including the elevator pitch? So we'll spend some time on all of these three topics in the next uh, two hours. So let's realize that every company goes through this picture. You start by spending money. And at some point, you turn the corner, and you start like making some money. Then you break the break-even point, and hopefully you make a lot of money. Now, some people, the, this negative is very little. If you were setting up a barber shop, it's very large. If you're setting up a semiconductor company, but all companies have something looks like this. So you need to figure out a financial model, kind of Excel spreadsheet. To how much are you going to need to raise before you turn the corner? How long before you reach break-even? How much money will you make? No VC is going to give you money till you have some version of this in a spreadsheet. So you have to up compute your needs. And then the th question comes in is, how much should I raise? How much, what is the right amount to ask to raise in the first place? Suppose, let's take an example. Your business was going to require to get to profit $6 million. You did some back of the envelope calculation. How much should you raise? What would you say? What would you say? How much should you raise in the first time? Uh, so you're doing a revenue of six million. No, not revenue. It's going to take six million before I hit, you know, break-even point of profitability. Right, so I would say uh, have a little bit uh, room, so seven million. There's seven million. Any other answers? First, first, first time. First time. Yeah. Million, 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 million. Why not two million? Why not two million? Mm -hmm. Because two million will be good for what? Hmm? Yeah. 
Yeah. So short answer is you obviously don't want to raise all of it. Why? Because right on the beginning, you have no value. So whatever value somebody puts on the company, you'll give up 95% of the company. What's the point? You're working for the man. So you, don't, you want to risk, raise as little as possible so you don't dilute while not too little. Fact is, this number has to be computed. When you start a company, you have execution risk, technology risk, team risk. We don't know. There are a bunch of risks. At some stage, you have de-risked the company to some degree. For example, you have a prototype working. You can show the darn thing is working. So you have reduced some technology risk. Then you have 10 people who bought it, 10 customers. It's not a million customers, 10 customers. So you have to reduce the risk a little bit more. Point is, you have to actually compute the time to go from A to B. How many months? Is it seven months? Is it two months? Is it one and a half year? You need to make sure you raise the amount of money necessary to survive going from A to B. If you don't, what happens? Now, you still don't have a prototype. You raise money for six months. Six months later, you still don't have a prototype. You still don't have a customer. Now you have spent half a million dollars. You look riskier than before. There's a famous Chinese proverb. Don't try to leap a Kenyan in two bounds. You get it? You've got to jump all the way across the Kenyan. Otherwise, you'll be dead. So this is what people, most people ask, how much to make? Say, we'll raise a million. I say, why? Uh, it'll be good for a year. <laughs> or what happens in a year? I don't know, but one year is a pretty long time. Well, if you don't have a, any, you haven't de-risked the company, you'll look even worse. You have to compute how long will I, how many months will it take to go from A to B. You have a spreadsheet with how many people you need, what are you burning per month, so then you compute that number. And when you go to VCs and you haven't done this, or any investor, they will sort of laugh you out of the room or, or, or be sympathetic to you. So you better compute this number. Now let's understand the motivation, because you have several sources of, of, of raising funding. Each of this source, they have their own motivation. In the beginning, the only person who will give you any money is friends, family, and fools. And that's a technical term. People use it, actually, FFF. Why will they give you money, by the way? They only give you money because they see something in you. They like you. You know, this is when you go to your mom or your dad. They don't have any other understanding of how your business will really work. Then you have angel investors. Angel investors are rich people who have made some money. And they invest because they, they, you know, they, they, they invested in real estate, they invested in stock market, they got some bond, they still have some money left over. So they want to invest in companies like that for that reason, plus they have a couple of other emotional reasons. Sometimes they see a younger themselves in you. They say, a fine young man, I was just like him when I was that age. I'm going to invest in him. They get excited about that. Sometimes they were into some industry and now they're retired or no longer, and they, this allows them to connect with, the, with that industry. So they have domain expertise. They think they can add value. Yeah, trucking, yeah, trucking, excellent. I was there for 30 years. Love that trucking. I must in, invest in this guy. He's doing trucking. So they have emotional reason as compared to VCs, which have no emotional reasons. Their reasons are completely, will there be an exit? How will I get my money back? Is there traction? Traction meaning, is dog eating the dog food? And we'll describe in more detail. Then you have strategic investors. These people invest in you because they want access to your technology, your challenge, your knowledge, whatever. So in my last company, the Bitser Mobile, which we started in January of 2011, well, we started actually June of 2010, uh, what happened? In the beginning, the founders put in $75,000 as a seed money. That's the friends, family, and fool. And we hired some offshore developer. We got something wiggling. Then I was able to raise 330000 from angel investors, from four or five guys. That allowed us to finish a product 1.0 and got our first customer interested, which was Chevron. Then I was able to raise $2.5 million from VC, because now we had a customer, we had a product. Six months later, Chevron Technology Ventures comes, came to me. They said, we are quite interested in you know, this technology we like. Can we put some money in? So I got strategic investor, one and a half million dollars from Chevron Technology Venture. 
So I had actually went through all four of them in my last company. So this is not normal. How do you want to do that? But you have other crowdsourcing format like Kickstarter. Why do you put invest in a company in Kickstarter? Well, I still don't understand why. <laughs> it's kind of coolness, cool thing to do. Because sometimes there's a, some, in Kickstarter, there is no direct equity involved. There's some other for, uh, one they have equity. But that's this kind of a coolness factor. Of course, then you have the grants, the as small business innovation research grant, SBIR grant. So we'll touch on these, uh, all of these a little bit more, but wanted to give you the big picture. And then the question is, what do you need when? So this picture sort of helps you understand. In the beginning, when you're, you are friends, family, and fools, and angel investors. And this is when you get to some kind of a valley of death is, this is your you know, spending money and there's a lot of risk. Some people don't come out of that valley. And then you get ready for VC. Then you have your first round called Series A, second round, third round, and this is early stage VCs. And then there are late stage VCs. They're different kind of animals. They don't necessarily the same firm. They're different firms, differently optimized. Finally, when you get ready, you may have an IPO. You, then you approach public markets. Yeah. The question I have is, you said the example of $6 million. Yeah. So angels would maybe pay up to two, two and a half. Of maybe three or four. Well, none, less than that, more like one to two. Yeah, over a period, you know, the four family pools and angel yeah. combined. So how do you get the best three? Do you actually get in a VC to come in during the value of death or? Well, no, so I was, uh, in, in my case, uh, we had a VC come in uh, because we were able to convince at least one VC that this is up and coming hot technology, you better jump on this now. Now, in, in my case, Kleiner, Perkin, Sequoia, I talked to all of them. They were already had put in a similar mobile security industry. I had to find a second tier VC, which the best entrepreneurs were not going to him. And I was, I was able to convince him, look, you're not going to get the hottest deal. This is as hot as it gets. <laughs> so, you know, it's early stage. Yes, it's not all proven out, but why don't we jump on it now? And he did. So sometimes you go for the, not the most good looking girl, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about valuation in a few minutes, but the fact is, good news is that's a question you don't have to ask. They will tell you what your valuation is. You're not an expert on valuation. So that's the good news. You, the way the process works is you show investors how great you are, what the potential is, and they come back with the valuation. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, how it happens, and why, how do they compute it. But you don't have to come up with it. And the other thing is, I mean, uh, some of the strategic investors also, like technology companies, they have all of their, they have their VC arm. Mm -hmm. So uh, is it true that they are investing on seed rounds? Also? Some are. So it depends on a bunch of them. Like Citrix has a venture arm when they put the first, like an angel, first 50,000 to 250,000. But many of them are late stage. So each, each one of them is different. So you have to really talk to them and who's early stage, who's late stage. They come in both flavors. So let's to understand between angel and VC, what's the difference? So this chart is a little hard to see. Maybe I'll describe. In general, per year, this is from last year data, angels invested $21 billion in about 30,000 deals. $21 billion. And average angel round was 345K. That's funny because IRA is 330, right there. Average investment, how much does the angel invest per deal? 37,000. That's good news because many of you in the room could be angel investor. You did not even realize that. Yeah. And guess what? You think they're really rich people? Not so much. Even you take the data across all the United States, average angel investor income is $90,000 and net worth of 750K. All of you qualify. <laughs> so think about that. As compared to VCs, they typically invest about $30 billion. This is 2013 data. And the uh, average VC fund size is $149 million, And they put about a total of $7.5 million per deal. Not up front. They may put $3 million, then put follow on. Average is $7.5 million, how much they put in. So that gives you an idea. There are about 20 to $30 billion is invested every year about 3,000 deals by VC and twice as many by angels. So there's some interesting statistics here. So if you want to learn a little bit more about it, 
I've given you a few websites to check it out. So first one, angelcapitalassociation.org. This is the association. It educates you all about angel investment, how to start a group, how to be an angel investor, what questions do you ask, well, how, do you, how does it work? If you spend half an hour on that site, your IQ will go up by a point and a half. Then there are a bunch of time, since angel investing could be tedious, you have to do due, due diligence, ask a bunch of questions. Not everybody knows what question to ask. Many of these people have come together as groups, and they hire like one admin person who does all the riff-raff collection and you know, get people lined up. All they do is show up with a wine glass, sit down for once a month, and listen to five or 10 presentations. Kind of like Thai angels. That's what they do. Except in the wine glass, they're having a samosa. <laughs> so, so it's the same kind of a deal. So this is a typical profile of an angel investor. You know, this guy was the CEO of uh, PayPal, made some money, and then he's the, if you saw the Facebook movie, he's the one who wrote the first half a million dollar check to Zuckerberg. And uh, now he's doing a lot of angel investment. So it's a, somebody who's made some money and is passionate about staying connected. He says he does it he, to feel useful and to stay connected and to mentor the younger generation. So he's quite prolific. So this is what the Angel Capital Association website looked like. I gave you the URL before, but it's, you know, just to spend some time here, you, it's a lot of interesting data there. Maybe, Be, yeah. Did you mention what I mentioned? I, I, you said, but yeah. you should mention something about <coughs> Launchpad? Well, you should mention more every third of Yeah. So Thai has done a fantastic job of finally setting up a Launchpad and a Thai Angel Fund which has made some significant, several in, uh, investment, maybe 30 or 40. And an exit also, they've made some money. So these people were started like a hobbyist, but they're now getting notoriety and serious. So, and they have a place here when you can start your startup. So you should, you should take advantage of that, being part of this ecosystem. And uh, so contact you or, uh, or well, Prashant. Every third, every third uh, Monday, they yeah. have a triangle meeting. Yeah. And uh, bank, uh, bank, uh, Ven Shukla and also, what's his name, uh, Guy uh, Prashant Shah. Yeah, he's the managing director. So you should definitely check that out. And you can become an angel investor simply by joining the group. You can learn about angel investing because there's a lot of complexity involved. So let's talk about valuation, how angels invest. What would you say is the fair price of this how much should it be worth? Any any guesses? What would I say? What do you think? Five thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars. How about the young lady over there? What do you think? Two thousand. Huh? Two thousand dollars. Fact is, we have no idea. It's a black <laughs> box. Five dollars. Five dollars could be five dollars exactly. See, I, I can't use this analogy in this case, but normally when I teach, I tell people how much would you pay for a pakora. And I hear number like two thousand dollars, five thousand. Nobody really knows pakora is. Can't use that to this crowd. <laughs> I have to invent a black box. So a company is like a black box. Nobody knows what should be the right price. And angel investors are not sophisticated investors. They don't know what the price is. That's why you use something called a convertible note. Convertible note says, I have no idea what this is worth, but I like it. And when somebody smarter than me figures out a price, this loan I'm giving you will become turned into stock at that price. So that's, it's very simple because it avoids the whole discussion what the company is valued at, especially with your uncle or your angel investor. The paperwork is one or two pages, very, and there's almost no legal fees or very minimal legal fees. You can do a convertible note very easily. So it will convert into stock when company is put a proper valuation. then it could be repaid or they possess the collateral because it's, uh, the IP of the company is the collateral. So it doesn't get paid, it, it gets repaid or they, uh, the note holders own the IP of the company. That, that is the biggest risk. Yeah. But it creates, yeah, in the back. How, how often do entrepreneurs get away with uh, negotiating a, a convertible note that is essentially not uh, repayable? I have not seen that happen very often that it's almost always either convert. There should be some condition. It'll be forced to convert, and there are some conditions. 
So there are many examples on the internet. You can do a convertible note template search, and you'll find it. But typically, I've not seen that this situation that a lot of time it doesn't convert. Usually, one of the conditions holds true and it converts. No, it's con it's, sorry, it's convertible, but I mean it's not redeemable in the sense that you cannot force the company to bankruptcy. Yeah, you cannot. You cannot. <coughs> so this is, you know, you, you only do that. So yeah. All the, and all the convertible note holder, uh, <coughs> if suppose you are not doing right, then uh, they can force you to go bankrupt and possess all your intellectual Yeah, yeah. That time things have gone bad. Of, of the intellectual property. I've not seen that happening at all, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. If it happens, it's not as common that there are stories circulated about it. But I'm sure it has happened somewhere. It's not a common scenario. Because normally, one of the conditions do, does trigger. But let me talk about there are two problems with this convertible note. And how do you solve that? One, one problem is with the convertible note is, what if you become too successful? And this happened to Dropbox early investors. Dropbox investors, they raised about $100,000 or $200,000. But one year later, they became so successful so quickly that their first VC round was at $30 million valuation. So all the people who took all the risk, they got like you know 1% or something very small. They said, wait a minute. We took all the risk. You won't even be here if we hadn't taken the risk. You're too successful. We're screwed. <laughs> in, a, in a strange way. Well, second thing is, I'm giving you money now. So you're going to do the VC round six months later or nine months later. What do I get? Same deal as them? Well, that's not very good. I, I'm taking more risk. So there is a solution we're invented for both of these problems. Solution for first one was they put a cap on valuation. So now when you do the note, you say, whatever the, your valuation would be series B, I'm only going to pay the comp some cap. Let's say cap is 5 million. So if you do better than 5 million, 10 million, that's the price VC will pay. I will pay 5 million. That's my maximum ceiling. If VCs are paying 4 million, then I'll pay 4 million. So by putting a cap, it avoids the problem of you becoming too successful. And the second problem is typically with a discount price. Typical number is 20%. So if VC is going to offer some negotiation, VC is going to buy the, invest in the company at, let's say, 80 cents per share. I will pay 20% 20 20 less than that. I will pay, what, 64 cents per share. So this is my added incentive. I'll get a little bit more shares because my price is 20% discount to VC price. So that's how you mitigate those two situations. But other than that, is a simple loan secured by the intellectual property. Can you explain the cap on valuation? Yeah, cap means that uh, to understand cap, we need to understand what is valuation, which we are going to in a few seconds. But point is that if company, suppose a company had 5 million shares, and after much haggling and negotiation and arm wrestling, VCs agreed that the company is worth $2.5 million, however they came up with it. So what is the price uh, uh, per share? Price per share is 50 cents a share. And that's the price VCs are going to pay. Now, cap is the other problem when a company is, uh, uh, well, okay, let's take the other example. Suppose you put a cap of $5 million. Suppose the company was uh, valued at $10 million because we're doing so good. So if you had put in a $1 million and company valued at 10%, uh, 10 million, you were only going to get like 10% of the company for the, in, uh, for the people who are the convertible note holder. But if you had a cap, as far as you're concerned, company valuation will be at five because we put the cap of five. So you're likely to get a number closer to 20%. So this is to protects you if company becomes too successful and very highly valued, you get enough shares for the money you put in. It's to protect you against this, that scenario. It protects the angels more than it the protect, angels. Only for angels, yeah. Uh, uh, not angels, the, yeah, a convertible note debtor, yeah, angels, yeah, angels, angels. It yeah. basically uh, protects the investor, not the... Yeah, company. correct, always, yeah. yeah. Does it also protect the friends, family, and friends? Yeah, whoever used the convertible note. 
Yeah, whoever nudes the convertible note, which is usually angels and friends and family. So it helps them because it allows them to get at least sufficient uh, number of shares. So this, again, this doesn't happen all the time, but it can happen, and people will negotiate some cap. So like I said, it happened in Dropbox case that people who put the first initial money got so little for their shares because the company was so successful, the first round was at $30 million valuation. So I have a lot of material to go. Let me keep going. I, uh, any other question I can come back to, unless there's a burning question. So when you're raising money to invest, are the terms the same typically? Typically the same, because you don't, uh, you know, some guy invested in January and so you're putting in September. He said, wait a minute, I'm getting the same discount. So what I typically do, I lower the discount 20%, but if I'm going to be, you're coming in much later and I'm about to raise money, then your discount is only 10%. So you can play that round, and it could be even more than 20 if you're going to raise money next year. So let's talk about VCs. We t understood about angels. These are rich guys who are investing because they like the domain or they like you, and they use convertible load. What are the venture capitalists do? So this model is different. This is a model. It's a firm with a partner. It's a 10-year partnership. In a 10-year partnership, the idea is to invest in a company, help them, guide them, nurture them to an exit. These people are not necessarily rich. They're not putting their own money. They raise money from their investors, called limited partners. They invest in these companies. And, when they, and so this is the idea. You find a company, you nurture them, you guide them. The company grows up to be big. And when it goes to be big, then basically you cut the tree and you sell the lumber. That's the whole VC model. If this is a kind of a protected tree which you can't cut and sell the lumber, VC will not invest in it. They have 10 years to find the companies, put money in them, grow them, and they have to exit after. Otherwise, their LP will be very anxious. So you may have a fantastic idea, but if you're approaching a VC, they're five years into their fund, they'll hurry you up. It's like going to a restaurant at like quarter to 12, at quarter to midnight. I mean, they may seat you. But chef is going home at 12 midnight. They're going to hurry you up. Like, okay, what are you going to order? Order everything now. So you want to be careful. You want to ask, how old is the fund? When is the fund started? How much time do we have here? Yeah, gentlemen here. So uh, I'm just I'm curious. How did this uh, number get 7 to 10 years? It's 10 years. It's always 10 years, for, except for a biotech firm. It could be a little bit longer, because biotech takes that long. But in general, it's been 10 years. That's how the industry is shaped. Okay. Yeah, just uh, yeah, in the back. Yeah, at the end of the 10th year, what do they have a problem. So the possible solution are they sell their stock to another VC fund, or they force the company to an exit, or they do some kind of a buyout with some unsuspecting foreign investor, sell their share. They got to do something. Well, that or oh, companies doing well, then they don't. But yeah, companies doing like so-so, they may shut it down because they have to finish the job. They have to go home. Yeah. What is the rate of return they are expecting to? Make? So they're expecting uh, uh, they want to make 10x on every deal they put in. They know it's not going to work this way. Statistics tell them that in general, if you invest in 10 companies, two or three will die. Three or four will be like walking dead. They just get the money back. And one or two may be spectacular. So average will come out to be. The average return of the VC fund or the historically, if you look at the last 75 years, is 22% annually compounded, which is, that's why it's high return. That's why it's high risk, high return. Now, this number got all screwed up because all the funds after dot-com bust, they had negative returns. So there was a little problem for 10 years, which we have fixed mostly. Yeah. Uh, is there some publicly available uh, data on which VC funds have just raised money and how much is it? Not, yes. And how much they have raised money is possible. Uh, you go to VentureWire.com. Now, they may want money from you or not, but maybe they give you 30-day free subscription. But VentureWire.com is all the news about venture industry. I think there are a couple more like that. So you can figure it out. Yeah. 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 So yeah. they might be having a similar portfolio of what they call it as. So let's say they invested in biotech. Yeah. One company invested in biotech. Yeah. Or five companies. They all will not be same, you know, like they're all going to be the same. 
Yeah, so you know they have to manage a portfolio. So some are early stage, some are late stage. They carefully calculate: can we exit it by the time the ten years cycle is up? So sometimes they will not. They like the company, but they won't invest because of those restrictions. And also, what they invest in is depends on the background of the partner. If they don't understand that industry, they won't invest in it. So they're already invested. Yeah. My companies are not growing at the same pace. The same pace. Yeah. So they Yeah, they will, you know, they will, you know, they're on the board, so they're going to push you into, and that's what you're saying. Sometimes they push you into a situation you don't want to be pushed in. They'll force you to do an acquisition because they have to go home. And you're saying, I don't want to do an acquisition, but they have the control. When you take their money, when you take investor money, you give up control. So this is, you have to get used to that concept. And I'll talk a little bit more about how, we, how they invest. But in, what's the profile of a typical VC? So this is Reid Hoffman. Founder, CEO of LinkedIn. Now he's a venture partner at Greylock Capital. So these people have experience building companies. They're sympathetic to what people go through. So this is a, a, a you know successful guy. He's a, so he has his own philosophy. And if you want to learn about VC industry, this website is the National Association of Venture Capital, nvca.org. It has lots of data. So you can learn about how many funds, how many people they invested, what happened, and this kind of tells you where the investment was done. A lot of the, how much, 900 companies in clean tech, 17,000 in IT, 5,000 in healthcare, and the circle of the bubble tells you what areas were being invested in. So that can give you an idea of what's hot, what are people investing in, which subsector. So if you think about this, uh, last year was the strongest year we have seen in decades. Almost $40 billion, $48 billion was invested in 4,000 400 companies, 4,400 deals. So it has been hovering around 20 to 30 billion, but big jump last year. So things are moving, things are happening very hard in the venture industry. So let's talk about funding needs. Like I said, we go from doing your homework to prototype. You have different sources. You want to raise money for long enough. It takes about six months to raise money. So you want to be raising money for nine months. Then you're always raising money. It's painful. It's not that much fun. It's very, you give the same presentation over and over and over again to the same people who ask really sometimes dumb questions, but you have to look really excited. <laughs> it's, it's not fun. So you get pretty sick of it. I've been, several times I, was, I walked into VC, this is my last VC, I'm not pitching anymore. And twice, that's the VC who funded me. There must be something in attitude like, I don't care, whatever. You like it, you take it. You don't like it, I don't care. I'm going home. Maybe that worked twice. It worked twice. I can't believe this. <laughs> yeah. Some, some of the largest species like Sequoia and Planet, they appear to have some semblance of control over a lot of those IPO type exits that they have, even after the exit. So given the tenure are closed and limited, how does that occur? Is it just an impression that people get, or do they really have some control? Well, they usually don't want to be on the board after the company goes public or want to be get off as soon as possible because of liability reason. And the partnership agreement restricts them from being on public company's board. They need to be making money for LP and doing something else. Remember, they work for LPs. They look like they're guards, but they're mulazim. <laughs> they're not angels. Angels are work for themselves. Just a question on this side. Yeah. On your list side. Uh, the question was you mentioned timelines around you know, six months, yeah. 12 months, and when to raise. So is it like, if suppose a comp if an idea has gone into, the product has been developed and they've still not raised money ever, yeah. is there some point in the entire life cycle which is too late? Not really. There are example of companies who raised money. The company was AirWatch. Uh, it's a company in mobile security space. They were doing 100 million in revenue before they raised the first Series A. And Series A was 220 million. So there's no such thing. You could wait longer and then your, you know, your valuation will be high. When Facebook raised their first funding, uh, they had already been, had customers. They already have, have, were in several schools. So plus they were hot for reasons we can get into. There are 30 VCs looking at them at the same time. And that's why when they got the first offer, you know, they <laughs> rejected. The, they raised money series at $12.4 million at 100 million pre money valuation. So, you know, those are rare examples who are hot from day one. Yeah. How does B2C versus B2B market matter? Does it matter for... Yeah. 
So some investors, some VC firms only understand B2C and some only want to do B2B. They have the different theories around them. Like Hammer Winblad is a software VC where Prashant came from. They will only do B2B software. They will not do B2C. So because the reason is in B2B, business to business, market demands multiple players. There has to be a Juniper to exist for, in, for Cisco to exist. There has to be AMD, no matter how bad it is, there has to be an AMD for Intel to exist. In B2C, it's completely different. Winner takes all. You can beat me up with a hammer. I don't know what the number two auction house is after eBay. I don't know. I'm sure there is one. What's the number one, number two player online store after Amazon? I have no idea, and I don't care. What's the number two networking for business after LinkedIn? I don't know. I don't care. Don't want to don't wanna know. Uh, we can only remember one thing. So B2C is winner takes all. So very different mentality, how people invest, how people... Uh, so I'm a B2B kind of a guy. B2C scares me. <laughs> so question is, how do you approach investors? Um, most important thing is traction. They need to see some proof of traction. So what is traction? The best traction is that you have actual sales. What better traction than that? Dog is eating the dog food. If you don't have sales, you have some pilots going on. If you don't have pilots going on, you have some agreements to do pilots. If you don't have agreements, you have testimonials, people who love the idea. If you don't have testimonials, maybe you have name of the people who would be interested. <laughs> if you don't even have any names of the people, you have no game. Do not approach an investor. <laughs> you absolutely have zero traction. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the question is, um, when you're in the product development phase, right? Like yeah. you have a prototype, you're in the product development phase, you said, like, you know, we need some money in order to be able to approach customers and give them a product yeah. to try it out. Yeah. At that point, you don't have customers, you don't have money. So what... How do yeah, you so, but you have maybe some people who have seen the PowerPoint. And they, they, they think, absolutely, if this existed, we'll buy it. This is great. Okay, you just go for testimonials. The best you can do. I mean, my last company in Chevron, they were, in, I mean, so, you know, we actually, we, we were doing a instant mobile apps for enterprise. So we went to them and said, look, you have lots of SAP and Oracle application, but you don't want to write a, you know, this mobile app, that's, you don't have the people, but we have this template-based approach. In a couple of days, you can have mobile app. So they said, yeah, no, that's very nice, that's very cute, but we got a bigger problem. We don't use password, we use smart cards, we use all this high security thing. We can't even log in from our iPhones and iPads. Can you solve that problem? We use this Kerberos single sign-on protocol using X.509 certificates. We said, well, oh, of course. Uh, sure. Should we talk about that? They said, really? They said, we have asked this question to everybody. Nobody can do it. Show us a demo. I said, OK. So we went to like Wikipedia, like, what is Kerberos? Never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we had nothing to lose. We, we were getting thrown out anyways. So I found by doing some searching, well, looking at some papers, some Russian group, Ukrainian or something, they said they, they can do this. We met with them. So they wanted like $50,000 to write it. I said, great, let's just do it. Once, then we had to, Chevron wanted to, you know, they said, show us what are you working on? Show us some architectural diagram. We took the Russians with us. Next day, they changed the price to 750K. Yeah, wow. So that's when they found out the Chevron is a customer. <laughs> so we had to dump them. Then I had to find a brand new team in the meantime, I had to drag out the discussion with legal contract, the non-disclosure and confidentiality. I, I kept telling Chevron, well, we can't sign it. We disclose it are totally unacceptable. And then my lawyer is in Scotland. He's not back. I was dragging out that legal negotiation so we can build the demo. <laughs> so it was pretty painful. But somehow, by November, we had a demo. They saw it, and we got the order. So we got the order basically kind of a PowerPoint, you know, some minimum demo. Then took us another three, four months, six months to build the product. So you can do it. So once you uh, have a hook, in, yeah. then you start. Yeah, yeah. Hook. You have a reason to go in with a hook of some kind. Okay. So question is, yeah? Question, does it matter if you have paid pilots versus? Yeah, sure. Paid pilots are better than free pilots. <laughs> because anybody can do free pilots. And, and what, I mean, pilot does give you validation. Well, somebody took the effort to 
you know, assign their IT manager to do something, set it up. So you know, they must have seen some value. Because it's easy to say, sure, we like it. But when you have to do stuff to install it, then you know, you're already committing resources. That shows to investors that this must be something here. Otherwise, they're not going to just let you walk in. So let's understand, how do, you, how do VC fund you? So VC gives you money. What do you give them? What do you give them? You give them shares. But these are not the same shares you get. You get common shares. These people get special shares. It's called preferred shares. Why? Because it protects them and things don't go well. Things like veto rights, board control, participation rights, so they can put more money into the company if the company is doing well. So they have all kinds of rights. The fact is, unlike what you see on Shark Tank, control doesn't come from 51% ownership. Control comes from the board. So VC will always make sure they have sufficient control. And that may not be a bad thing. Because the only reason VC is putting the money in is what? To make money. Why are you starting the company? You have maybe a couple other reasons. You want to make some money. You want to change the world. You want to tell your dad you're better than him. Who knows what? <laughs> you have a bunch of other emotional, <laughs> ego reasons going on. They don't. They just want to make money. So some of you know Rajiv Madhavan, when he was starting this company, the synthesis company, Ambit. So you know he got fired by, from the board. They bring in Prakash Balero. He was like pissed off, angry, wanted to do this VC, couldn't have a decent lunch with him. He was all uh, totally upset. Like I think 18 months later or two years later, he got a check for $21 million. Because Prakash sold the company, and he was, he was still a shareholder, even if you're not the CEO. So you know Rajiv's story, then he's happy after that. <laughs> so there are a bunch of other things which VCs demand. They, their shares are called preferred shares. So let's take an example. How does the valuation things work out? So suppose VC will value the company based on what they can sell it for. Is it worth their time? They will give you all kind of a scientific, you know, we did a very number crunching. We looked at all kinds of trends. Basically, what we're saying is, OK, if I put here 10 million, how much can I make realistically? Is it worth my time? So Sequoia has an internal number. If their portion doesn't, they don't make $100 million in a company, they're not interested. So for them to make 100 million, company probably has to sell for half a billion or three, four hundred million if they own 33%. So this means if you have a company idea, you can sell it for 30 million, and if you own half of it, you could be quite okay. They won't let you because they have their own metrics. Yeah. No, this is just Sequoia's benchmark. No, no, that's what. Yeah. This is the Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah. So thank God you're saved, you're okay, you don't have to go to the million. So let's see how this works. So you suppose you put in three million, they agree on a company of three million, companies worth three million dollars. So VC is putting in two million. What percent of the company does VC own now? 66%. Who else? Who is good at math? Where are the people from Madras? Huh? <laughs> so how much? 23%? 20%? Any other numbers? We got smart people here. Answer is 40%, by the way. Post money, because that's what I was asking. So this is what it is. Whatever the company was there, valued at, that's called pre money valuation. So it was like a, imagine a jug of water. So it has 3 million in it. You pour in two million of fresh dollars on top of it. So total is five, post is five million. So in this calculation, just like you correctly said, VCs will own forty percent of the company with that math. So it's called pre-money and post-money. Pre-money, right before money goes in, what is the company worth? Money comes in. That's the post-money valuation. So when you sit down on a Saturday night with your friends and say, "Oh, we just raised uh, uh, three on four. You know, you'll be, you could be really cool. You, 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 you know, what do you mean? You don't understand? You mean with is $3 million on a pre-money of four. So you can be very cool about this. Now you learned this new terminology. <laughs> or we had a seven post. 
You don't even say post money valuation, that seven post. Very cool. <laughs> so let's understand VC's business model. Yeah. How do you trust that the VC values it fairly, right? I mean, they have an inter inherent interest in devaluing. Devaluing it. So this, the, the struggle is, just like anything when you don't know the value, what a willing buyer is willing to pay is the value. What's the difference between begging and negotiating? <laughs> In negotiation, you have leverage. If you have no leverage, you're begging. So the best thing to do is you get two or three VCs lined up. So in my company, Britzer Mobile, when I was raising Series B, that's, I was lucky enough to, have, to get three term sheets at the same time. So one PC offered, I think, 10 million. One strategic investor, not a real VC, offered like 17 or 18 million. And I was able to come to VC, and you know, I'd love to work with you, but you know, you gotta be, this is like too low, we can't work with this. So I was able to get in between 14 million because I had leverage. Secretly, I never would have taken them money from strategic, but I was able to use them as leverage. So I had three VCs competing. So then you can do that. So how do these VCs make money? Yes, sir. Uh, how, how common is it for entrepreneurs to successfully negotiate a kind of a, some semblance of control over the exit veto, where it's not a complete blanket veto by the VC, where they say, okay, well, if you're investing at five million dollars and you exit within 12 months, then, then, up, then, up, then up, within, you know, if it's above 50 million, then it, you, you don't have any say in the matter. We can take, take that call. Or if it's two years and 100 million, whatever, something like yeah. that. So there's some semblance of... Uh, yeah, that's possible. It's possible. See, again, remember, how badly do they need you? If you are like the rocket scientist and they gotta have you, you have a little bit more control over negotiating. But the, basically what VC is trying to pre prevent it, the irrational emotional founder behavior, which happens more often than you think. VCs are like a robot, they're Mr. Spock. You know, in, you know, they're not trying to, they just wanna make money. You have a bunch of other issues with you. <laughs> and they know it. <laughs> Yeah. With a $15 million exit in his, in his pocket, yeah. you know, it may be a perfectly rational move from there. Right, right, but may not be for you. So this is, you know, that's why you get to know, and this is what we are about to talk about, you get to know your, v, your VC, not to say what the thought process is, how do they, because VCs are human too, they all have different philosophies. Some are very cutthroat about it, some are willing to give you some more leverage and control, but fact is, they want to have control who can come into the next round of funding or who doesn't. And sometimes what you can do is you can negotiate a threshold that as long as the company valuation at, uh, could be more than 60 million, we should be allowed to sell. So you can negotiate some kind of a threshold. What VC is trying to avoid is that you find a, some offer at 15 million, you wanna sell because you'll make your 5 million and they look really stupid. That they just, they put 3 million and they made 6 million, yay. So you can negotiate that as long as above this number, then we should be able to do that. So this is the whole game plan. These people raise money from limited partners. They have 10 years to invest the money into companies. And when, as companies are sold, then they give that profits and the original capital back to the LPs. They keep 20% of that gain for themselves. That's called carried interest or carry for short. Plus they get 2% per year for management fee. That pays for beautiful offices, the most expensive conference room table you'll ever see, first class travel, all that stuff. That comes from the 2%. So this is their simple model. So they, who are the LPs by the way? LPs could be rich families. It could be pension fund like CalPER, California, retirement pension, whatever. You know, IBM has a big pension fund, they have to make money. So th this is a, one of the asset class. They put some money in real estate, some in stock market, some in bond market, some in foreign currency, and a little bit in this private equity and venture capital activity. They want to diversify their risk. Then these people are general partners. They hire some associates, some executive in residence, and they invest in multiple companies. So let's take an example of that. But even LPs are smart. They don't put all the money they have allocated for VC into the same VC fund. They have some early stage funds, some late stage fund some software, some medical, they've diversified their risk by the type and the stage of investment. So the CalPER or University of California pension fund, these are all big giant pools of money. So they have endowment from Harvard University, big $38 billion. Well, how do you keep $38 billion growing? 
you have to you some five to ten percent is allocated for venture activity. So in the ten years window, mm -hmm. so generally what is your observation? By what time they generally hit that? So the first first uh, three years is they invest in company. The next six years they harvest by selling. Last year they celebrate. But really what happens is they have many funds happening in parallel. So they raise one fund. When they have finished raising the first three years investing, they raise another fund. So there could be multiple funds happening simultaneously, slightly offset by each other. So let's take an example. How does the math work out? Suppose I'm going to oversimplify this example. There are only one LP. They invest $50 million in a VC fund. And VC fund makes an investment in a Series A of software company. They put $3 million. And they get 40% ownership for that. Sometimes later, they find a materials company. They made $8 million Series B investment, and they get 18% ownership for that. And then they do one more in a semiconductor company, and they get 25% ownership for the $10 million they put in. So they just do three things, just to simplify the example. Now, how does what happens? So suppose after some time, this company gets shut down. The second company raises another Series C and then have an IPO at $500 million valuation. And third